All right. How are you doing with the material from this morning? Good. Good. It's heavenly. That's what your wife says about you. <laughs> I want to remind you, you know, when we look at biblical stuff, I think I mentioned this this morning, if you get severely challenged in your own reading, in a Bible study, here, you just take a deep breath. It does not have to be resolved by 4.36. <laughs> there is time and grace for us to learn and grow as followers of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to have us start with a video clip and open it up to questions, and then I've got some other pieces that I'm thinking about reading if we have time that hearken back to some of your comments and questions from this morning. Okay? So, Jake, if you would... Um, Talk, play, play the hope of heaven. Here in England, we have so much weather, it hurts sometimes. And on a day like today, suddenly the clouds roll in and there they are all fluffy and pretty. And some people, when they look up at those clouds here, or indeed in America or elsewhere, they have been taught to think, maybe that's what heaven's like. We know we'll go up there to be with God and the angels, and we'll be sitting on those clouds and maybe playing harps and wearing long robes and all that stuff. And I've even heard people who talk like that quite seriously, as though they really do think that to get to heaven, you somehow have to go flying up in the sky and land up on one of those things. Now, we all know, in fact, that clouds wouldn't sustain you even if you tried to sit on them, but that doesn't stop people talking as if that's where we were going to be. There is one obvious problem about that. came out in a Far Side cartoon a few years ago. There was a guy sitting on one of these clouds with a harp, and he was saying, you know, I wish I'd brought a magazine. He was bored because that idea of just sitting around on a cloud all day forever and ever and ever, like, why would you want to do that? So we've got this problem. There are some people who really do think that that's what life after death and salvation is going to be like. And there are other people who say, if that's what it's like, it's not as much fun as it was cracked up to be. The good news is that the biblical view of salvation, of life after death, isn't like either of those. It's much more interesting, and what's more, much more hopeful. There's a great deal of talk about heaven in popular Christian circles, but also, of course, quite a bit in the Bible itself. But very few people, in my experience, stop to ask, what actually is heaven? Where is it? What sort of a place or a space actually are we talking about here? I have met people who really seriously believe that heaven is a place, an area within our space-time universe, so that if only you could go up far enough, you would eventually get there. Quite what that says about people who live the other side of the world. Do they have to go down? And is it down there as well? I'm really not sure. But most people realize that it's actually not like that. There was once um, a Russian astronaut who went out into space and came back and declared that he'd been out there and looked for God and there couldn't be a God because he hadn't seen him. He said he'd been out there, no God, no heaven, no nothing. Quite a lot of people hearing that thought probably just as well, actually, because that wasn't the sort of thing that heaven or God was supposed to be anyway. So what is heaven? Where is it? A lot of people still, though they think it isn't a physical place, imagine that heaven is a long way away. They think of earth and heaven as strange different sorts of realities, but separated by a great gulf so that you couldn't actually imagine them coming together. And therefore, if they think of someone, whether it's God or a human being, in heaven, they imagine that God or that human being is a long way away, can't really be in contact with us, must have really nothing much to do with us at all. 
But you know, in the Bible, it's not like that. In the Bible, heaven and earth are the two interlocking spheres of God's good creation. It's as though God makes heaven and earth, and right from the beginning in the book of Genesis, it appears that they overlap, that they're supposed to work together somehow, in a mysterious way, of course, so that God can show up and then go away again, not to a great distance, but so that he is known and then not known, and people have a sense of his presence and then a sense perhaps of his absence, and then a sense of at least his possibility. Heaven and earth somehow merging and mingling, but in such a way that we can never actually control that, though we can experience it and we can learn to respond appropriately to it. So that's one of the first things to say about heaven in the Bible, right there from the book of Genesis, that God created heaven and earth, and it looks as though they're supposed to belong together. And you can cut from that straight across to one of the most wonderful things that St. Paul says in one of his greatest letters, the letter to the Ephesians, when in chapter 1, verse 10, he says that God's plan always was to sum up in Christ everything in heaven and on earth. Again, we have that sense of heaven as being God's space, but designed to work together with earth, which is our space. And of course, that fits very well with the picture at the end of the book of Revelation, where, as we saw in an earlier session, we have heaven coming down to earth. But it's not just that heaven and earth are supposed to overlap. One of the great truths which we find in Scripture again and again is that heaven is, as it were, the control room for what happens on earth. There are some wonderful passages in the Old Testament which make this quite clear, particularly when the Jewish people in the Old Testament are faced with the might of pagan empire. When you get in the book of Daniel, Daniel and his friends facing some of the greatest kings and kingdoms of the pagan world of their day, what they end up saying to those kings and their kingdoms is, listen, there is a God in heaven and that God is actually sovereign over earth. And you, who claim to run this earth, had therefore better watch out because the God who is in heaven is in fact calling you to account. Now, of course, that's one of the reasons why people think that heaven must be a long way away from earth, because they say, if heaven is the control room for earth, doesn't seem to be doing a great job of things right now, earth is still in a pretty awful mess. But again and again, the stories we find in the Bible are stories about the God who lives in heaven, which is not far away at all, just as it were, round the corner, as close to us almost as breath, it sometimes seems. The God who lives in heaven, wanting actually to make his sovereign rule known on earth, but knowing perfectly well that if he does it instantly and immediately, it will have some pretty devastating effects. And so bringing that sovereign rule to bear through the work of his spirit, of his son, of his powerful love, the message of his hope and his love coming from heaven to earth to transform earth in a way which will heal it and not simply burn it up, as it were. So what happens when we think of heaven as the control room for earth? How is that going to play out? We find in the Gospels Jesus as the place where heaven and earth meet. To understand this properly, you have to understand a bit about what the ancient Jews thought about the temple. When we think about the temple in Jerusalem, we may imagine that it was, as it were, just like a big church on a street corner. And you'd go there to worship, and you'd go there to say your prayers, and you'd maybe go there for special festivals, but that would be about the long and the short of it. For the Jews, it was much, much more than that. For the Jewish people, it was as though the temple was the place where heaven and earth really did overlap, so that when they went into the temple, it wasn't just, let's pretend that we're in heaven, it was actually, when we're in this building on earth, we are actually also in heaven. 
Actually, some church architects in the Christian world have tried to do something similar. In the Eastern Orthodox churches, they have the bit at one end which symbolizes heaven and the bit at the other end which symbolizes earth, and you have pictures on the screen in between of the saints so that the people who are, as it were, in earth can see what it might be Uh, might be going on actually in heaven. And then the gospel book is brought out because that's a reality which comes from heaven to earth. And the sacraments are brought out because they come from heaven to earth. And so the whole of the church building is designed to say, listen, when we're worshipping, we can be in heaven and on earth at the same time, anticipating the great reality when God is going to bring the two of them together at last. So what does that then tell us about what many people couple with heaven, not earth, but actually hell. I think a lot of language got off on the wrong foot somewhere in the Middle Ages when people, and you can see it in Michelangelo's great painting in the Sistine Chapel, people started envisaging heaven and hell as, as it were, equal and opposite realities so that from roughly the 12th or the 13th century onwards in Western culture, both Catholics and Protestants tended to say, well, you go through your life and the aim is either to get to heaven or to go to hell, and you've got to choose wisely in this life, and then hopefully you'll get to heaven rather than hell. But in the Bible, heaven is not equal and opposite with hell. Heaven, as I've said, is designed to come together with earth, And the word hell, in the way we use it, is a rather loose and actually not always very helpful way of holding out that awful possibility that because God has given us responsibility as human beings, we have the right, if we so choose, to say to him, we do not wish to be part of this new heaven plus earth reality. We just want to stay in our own world, a world which we can control, a world which we can make. We want to keep heaven out of the picture. And because we have the dignity of being human beings, God has given us the right to do that. And that is a tragic possibility, which, according to the New Testament, many do in fact embrace. But it needn't be like that. And to try to use that awful possibility as a way of frightening people into saying, well, you better avoid hell, so look, here's how you get into heaven, often can appeal to exactly the wrong instincts, a kind of selfish self-preservation instinct, rather than the thing which makes the gospel what it is, which is the promise that God is going to make the whole world over anew and has invited us to share in that making new right here and now in our own lives, but also to share in the work of what he's going to do to bring it all about. So we shouldn't then think of heaven and hell as places within our cosmos, one maybe a long way up in the sky and another way, another one way down there on earth. They are rather states of existence, but they are states of existence which are not the same sort of thing at all, because in the life of heaven, when it is joined to earth, we become more truly human. And the point about hell, sadly, is that is where people become less truly human, because you become like what you worship. And if you worship the God in whose image you are made, you become more genuinely human, And if you refuse to worship him, if you hold him at arm's length, if you say, no, I don't want to have anything to do with you or to have you having anything to do with me and my life, then you are, as it were, colluding with the dangerous possibility of becoming less and less genuinely human altogether. That is a tragic possibility. And we have to uh, be aware of that for all of us, even though the Bible has great promises about how, in fact, we can be part of God's new heavens and new earth. People often get puzzled when they read the New Testament, particularly for the first time, when in Matthew's gospel, Jesus talks about the kingdom of heaven, but in Mark and Luke and a little bit in John, he talks about the kingdom of God. Actually, for many Jews, those were two ways of saying the same thing. And because they were often reverent about not wanting to say the word God too often, they sometimes would say heaven when they meant God. 
The trouble is that many Christians reading Matthew's Gospel particularly find Jesus saying things like, um, if you do this, if you do that, you will be called either the least or the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And because many Christians assume that the name of the game is to go to heaven, they think that Jesus is talking about a kingdom, namely a place, called heaven, where you might or might not go at the end of time or the end of your life. But Jesus himself makes it quite clear in some of the very same passages that that's not what's going on. In Matthew chapter 6, right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and it's as it were in the middle of the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, if you look at how that great sermon really works and is structured, Jesus teaches us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. In other words, the kingdom of heaven is not a place called heaven where you go to escape from earth. The kingdom of heaven means the sovereign rule of heaven, which is coming to birth on earth. So why does Jesus say in Luke's gospel to one of the brigands who was being crucified alongside him, today you will be with me in paradise? Isn't that going away from earth and being somewhere else? Well, yes, it is. Paradise is actually an old word not used very often in the Bible, just from time to time, which literally means a beautiful garden, a lovely resting place. But the point about paradise is not that it's a place to go and live forever and ever. Paradise, or in that sense heaven, is a place where you go to be refreshed until the time comes when you can continue your journey to your destination. So the fact remains, when Jesus spoke about heaven, he was basically speaking about God's rule coming on earth, but obviously for people who die before that final event happens, they will be with him in heaven or in paradise until the work of the kingdom on earth is actually complete. So to sum up, heaven is God's space. It is where there is God's peace and justice ruling and reigning, and God's plan is to bring that together with the life of earth. He has made that real in Jesus, doing in Jesus what the temple in Jerusalem had already symbolized, bringing heaven and earth together. And then those who follow Jesus find that in the power of his spirit, heaven and earth can start to come together where they are as well, in their lives and through their lives. So we shouldn't think of heaven as just some place where we might end up one day if we're lucky. We should think of it as the reality which can come to birth here and now. We will talk in a later session about what does happen after death for those who belong to Jesus, because it it isn't just about going to heaven forever and ever. It's going to heaven, yes, but then something much more wonderful out beyond that. But that's another story. For now, let's just focus on this, that God's space and our space are meant to work together, and we can learn what that means right here and right now. One or two things to think about. What stood out for you? Interested you? Uh, challenged you? Yeah. Yes. Well, after the discussion this morning, I kind of concluded that time is something that we humans deal with. But God is not limited by time, and therefore people aren't pending somewhere. When Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise, forget time. It was there where we're going to be, but time is not a factor. It all happens without time, which is kind of a mind blower. Might have to be real loud with that. I'm thinking um, he, he was talking about time not um, impacting us after death, so to speak. Time doesn't really exist for God. It's not hampered by it. God is not hampered by time, Jim. Nor hampered by space. Nor hampered by space. Hmm. What was the phrase he used about um, you begin to? Resemble what you worship? That was amazing. That was, um, which would make sense, the Bible talking about idolatry so much. 
that that be one of the, the, the two major sins with uh, from the prophets. Yes? I remember when my mom's mom died, we were all at the hospital, and she talked a lot. She was in and out, and she would talk about uh, they were making a robe for her, and she said, oh, that's much too beautiful for me. I don't deserve that. And we're all like, what's she talking about? And another time she said, what are all these children doing in my room? They're making such a mess. They're throwing confetti everywhere. Well, she was seeing heaven and things going on in heaven right there. So, like, at what point, where he's saying they, they intertwine, at what point do you cross over and you can start to see those things? On your yeah. deathbed? Like, that just shows you. They didn't come down here to perform for her in her, her, her hospital room. It was like close. Yeah, it was here. Yes? Um, in answer to your question. A little bit louder, please. In answer to her question, I deal with a lot of clients who are dying. And one of my ladies that has passed recently, one of the other caregivers were there and they were talking. <coughs> and she told the caregiver that she was playing with the angels. Mm -hmm. Just out of the blue, she was playing with the angels. And then I was there five weeks later. She was still here, but she was interpreting it in different phases. He does seem to be saying things in ways that we don't typically speak about them. You know, I'm hearing difficulty with this time between the time we die and something else. That it's important that when we die, the something else is immediately, is immediate. Right? When I took comfort in the, um, when he said, I took comfort in what, when he said, paradise is the place where you'll go and be refreshed until God brings heaven and earth together. Yeah, I'm going to try to find, I've got it marked to read for you that he speaks more about that, yes. But he described it as heaven, where God is now. And so there's a heaven and there's a end time when the heaven and earth are going to come be, be, because there's our use of the word heaven and the more scriptural use of the word heaven, kingdom of heaven, where he was saying that there, there, it, it's, yes. But what we're waiting for, the peace that, that, that brings it all together is the second coming of Christ, the, the resurrection, when we are all resurrected and receive our new bodies that he would say is being prepared for us in heaven because that's what scripture seems to say that that's where our new bodies are being prepared by God to be uh, that we will inhabit and with, be energized by the spirit of God himself yes if the kingdom of heaven is today present with us today what are we as Christians expected to do to bring it about in today's See, that's, that's the biggest challenge to what he's saying, I think, for us as Christians. And this morning I, 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 I quoted um, some, a theologian that Aaron was talking about uh, that, that, that some folks, I think, were trying to trap him and said, do you believe in the resurrection, the, the bodily resurrection? And he said, well, most of the time I really don't because I don't live in such a way that indicates that I truly believe in it. On my better days... I believe in it, you know, and I, I think that's really the question, and that I think is the biblical piece, you know, it's like, how do we live now as being agents of, of this God who's got this wonderful plan and who's already given us the first fruits of that in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Now everything has changed, even though it might not look like it to us at present. Everything has changed. God is in the control room. No? He talks about a, um, when he refers to it as a command center or something, and that he's working to transform Earth. Transform Earth. And don't we all, just, and does he not transform us individually, and then we go about transforming? 
And he, he, would word, he would say the scripture says that our personal transformation is more of a side benefit than the primary benefit. That God's plan is to restore, renew, recreate the earth, all of it, all of us. And we are involved in, in that, that work is, is not done by us, but through us is how he words it. And I think that's a pretty scriptural way of looking at it. Which is pretty big and intense, and we should be then asking, well then, what's our work? And how would we find the answer to that question? What did Jesus do? Pray. Scripture. Scripture. Fellowship. Hum? Fellowship. Fellowship. Service. Service. Obedience. Healing. Healing. Instead of healing, we, we tend to fight about healing instead of healing. You know, don't we? Because what is healing? We, we think healing is something only God does. And if, but if we're actively involved in, in getting healing to happen, hmm. There's a lot of things to do. And if we look at Scripture, I, I tend to really like the Old Testament, that when the prophets were blasting the people of God for their sin, the sins were basically idolatry, worshiping other things which dehumanize the worshiper and dehumanize the people they have control over. And basically not taking care of people in need, the poor. Those are the two big sins, over and over and over again. And then we look at, that, at Jesus' ministry in light of that. Well, he's looking at a completely different economy, a different way of relationships that aren't based on um, what King Herod would say is right, or what we would say is a good business model. But, you know, how many times have you heard that won't work in the real world? Because we don't believe that God's in the control room and can bring about newness now. That's believing in the resurrection, and we often don't believe in the resurrection. I'm going to highlight some similar things, and you can stop me um, where you need to. Uh, he says, there is no agreement in the church today about what happens to people when they die. Not surprisingly, therefore, there's also confusion in, in the wider non-Christian world, not only about the fate of the dead, but also about what Christians are supposed to believe on the subject. He says, this is all the more, cu more curious in that the New Testament itself, which most churches officially regard as their primary doctrinal source, is crystal clear on the matter. In a classic passage, Paul speaks of the redemption of our bodies, Romans 8.23. There's no room for doubt as to what he means. God's people are promised a new type of bodily existence, the fulfillment and redemption of our present bodily life. The rest of the early Christian writings where they address the subject are completely in tune with this. He says, my proposition is that the traditional picture of people going to either heaven or hell as one stage of post-mortem journey with or, without the op with or without the option of some kind of purgatory or continuing journey as an intermediate stage represents a serious distortion and diminution of the Christian hope. Bodily re resurrection is not just one odd bit of that hope. It is the element that gives shape and meaning to the rest of the story we tell about God's ultimate purposes. Resurrection is the key. Instead of talking vaguely about heaven, then trying to fit the language of resurrection into that, we should talk with biblical precision about the resurrection and reorganize our language about heaven around that. Ooh, hard to do. He says the risen Jesus is both the model for the Christian's future body 
and the means by which it comes about. We, when I was a teenager, we had a, I had a jean jacket with a hand like this on it. One way. One way. Then he says, similarly, similarly in Colossians 3, 1 through 4, when the Messiah appears, the one who is your life, then you too will appear with him in glory. Paul does not say one day you will go to be with him. No, you already possess, possess life in him. This new life, which the Christian possesses secretly, invisible to the world, will burst forth into full bodily reality and visibility. Hmm. And then he says, uh, Paul, the, then the one who raised the Messiah from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies as well through his spirit who dwells in you. And going on, resurrection itself then appears as what the word always meant, whether like the, the ancient pagans people disbelieved it or whether like many ancient Jews they affirmed it, it wasn't a way of talking about life after death. It was a way of talking about a new bodily life after whatever state of existence one might enter immediately upon death. It was, in other words, life after life after death. Should I do that one again? He says it wasn't a way of talking about life after death. It was a way of talking about a new bodily life after, here's that time thing, whatever state of existence one might enter immediately upon death. In other words, it was life after life after death. He says, for a start, heaven is actually a reverent way of speaking about God so that riches in heaven simply mean riches in God, God's presence. Uh, heaven is a place where God's purposes for the world are stored up. I like that. I skipped that and I skipped that. Why will we be, why will we be given new bodies? Good question. According to the early Christians, the purpose of this new body will be to rule wisely over God's new world. Forget about lounging around and playing harps. <laughs> there will be work to do and we shall relish doing it. He says the new body will be a gift of God's grace and love. And um, how will it happen, these new bodies? As John Polkinghorne and others have urged, what we are talking about is a great act of new creation. Polkinghorne, in fact, offers, somebody should have an easier name to say than that, offers a contemporary metaphor that I find appealing, but that I have discovered some people find appalling. He, of course, puts it in a much more nuanced way, but I don't think it's too much of a caricature to express it like this. God will download our software onto his hardware until the time when he gives us new hardware to run the software again. <laughs> Paul says that we, God will give us new bodies. There may well be some bodily continuity, as with Jesus himself, but God is well capable of recreating people even if, as with the martyrs of lions, their ashes are scattered into a fast-flowing river. Yeah. And whenever the question of how is raised in the early Christian writings, how will we be given this? It's by the power of the Spirit. His next section, which he got into a little bit, is called Purgatory, Paradise, and Hell. And I'm not going to do much with the purgatory. We can do that privately later if you want. I therefore arrive forth at this view, that all the Christians departed are in substantially the same state, that of restful happiness. Though this is sometimes described as sleep, we shouldn't take this to mean that is a state of unconsciousness. Had Paul thought that, I very much doubt that he would have described life immediately after death as being with Christ, which is far better. 
Rather, sleep here means that the body is asleep in the sense of dead. While the real person, however we want to describe him or her, continues. The state, this state is not clearly the final destiny for which Christians de Christian dead are bound, which is, as we have seen, the bodily resurrection. But it is a state in which the dead are held firmly within the conscious love of God and the conscience, conscious presence of Jesus Christ while they await that day. There is no reason why this state should not be called heaven, though we must note once more how interesting it is that the New Testament routinely doesn't call it that and uses the word heaven in other ways. An important point follows from all this. Since both the departed saints and we ourselves are in Christ, we share with them in the communion of saints. And I point out, that's our language. That's Episcopal, Anglican language, the communion of saints. And when we listen on Sunday mornings, we hear it. And so we're not separate from those we love who have gone before. The whole company of heaven. Regardless of what heaven means. <laughs> a, a couple minutes about hell? Yeah. <laughs> it's warmer back there, isn't it? <laughs> Part of the difficulty of the topic, as with others we have been studying, is that the word hell conjures up an image gained more from medieval imagery than from the earliest Christian writings. So we get into trouble because of tradition as opposed to what Scripture says. Um, then he talks a little bit about where the word hell comes from, which is Gehenna. It's a valley next to the city of Jerusalem where it's where the dump was, and it burned continuously, which lots of dumps still do today. In fact, some dumps get vented, don't they? And the methane burns and burns and burns and burns. Um... The point is that when Jesus was warning his hearers about Gehenna, he was not as a general rule, telling them that unless they repented in this life, they would burn in the next one. As with God's kingdom, so with its opposite, it is on earth that things matter, not somewhere else. All right. I, I wrote great sentence next to this one. We cannot therefore look to Jesus' teaching for any fresh detail on whether there are really some who finally reject God and it is were, as it were have, reject, that, have that rejection ratified because that's not what he was about. Not that he didn't have beliefs about it, but that wasn't his main points. Where did I go from there? Give me a moment. scripture that you gave us here and the part that says a new heaven and a new earth and he's talking about the new heaven and the new earth for the first heaven and the first earth have passed, have passed away and I saw the holy city coming down prepared as a bride um, and all of that and he, they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God and all of that and he who was seated on the throne says, I am making everything new. Then he said, write down, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said, it is done, like Jesus said, it is finished on the cross. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. To those, those who are victorious will inherit, inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice the magical arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. So somehow we do have to realize there's two deaths. And we will, Christians will only die the first death, and then we go on with him 
because we we're already in that eternal life with him. Non-believers, according to this, will suffer a second death after some kind of judgment. And, you know, and so there is a second death. God is utterly committed to set the world right at the end. Yeah. This doctrine, like that of the resurrection itself, is held firmly in place by the belief in God as creator on the one side and the belief in his goodness on the other. And that setting right must necessarily involve the elimination of all that distorts God's good and lovely creation, and in particular, all that defaces his image-bearing human creatures. This is the sin piece. Uh, Let's see, not to put too fine a point on it, there will no, be no barbed wire in the kingdom of God. And those whose whole being has become dependent upon barbed wire, this is a metaphor he had, never mind. First, they all stem, he says, um, patterns of behavior of three things to be said about them. Uh, I think those who are not going to make it. First, the sins, they all stem from the primal fault, which is idolatry, worshiping that which is not God as if it were. Second, they all show the telltale marks of the consequent fault, which is subhuman behavior. That is, the failure to fully reflect the image of God, that missing the mark as regards full, free, and genuine humanness, for which the New Testament's regular word is hamartia. So most of the times you see the word sin in the New Testament, it's from that, missing the mark. Sin, we note, is not the breaking of arbitrary rules, Rather, the rules are the thumbnail sketches of different types of dehumanizing behavior. Third, it is perfectly possible, and it really does seem to happen in practice, that this idolatry and dehumanization becomes so endemic in the life and chosen behavior of an individual and indeed of groups, that unless there is specific turning away from such a way of life, those who persist are conniving at their own ultimate dehumanization. Hell, I think, is what he might say. Um, then he talks about um, how, th how these things happen, you know, how universalists see it and, and others. He said, um, over against these three options, I propose a view that combines what seems to me the strong points of two of them. The greatest objection to the traditional view in recent times in the last 200 years have seen massive swing towards universalism in the Western churches, at least the so-called mainstream ones, has come from the deep revulsion many feel at the idea of the torture chamber in the middle of the Castle of Delights. Have a hard time with hell being so close to heaven and then it's a place of torture. Um, and, and, and the concentration camp in the middle of the beautiful countryside, the idea that among the delights of the blessed, we should include the contemplation of the torments of the wicked. Uh, however much we tell ourselves that God must condemn evil if he is a good God, and those who love God must endorse that condemnation, as soon as those pictures present themselves to our minds, we turn away in disgust. Okay. Um, he goes on with this. Um, he says, My suggestion is that it is, a, that it is possible for human beings so to continue down the road of sin, of dehumanization, um, to refuse all whisperings of good news, all glimmers of the true light, all promptings to turn and go the other way, all signposts to the love of God, that after death they become at last, by their own effective choice, beings that once were human but now are not. And with the death of that body in which they inhabited God's good world, in which the flickering flame of goodness had not been completely snuffed out, they passed simultaneously not only beyond hope, but also beyond pity. So he doesn't hold back. There is no concentration camp in the beautiful countryside, no torture chamber in the palace of delight. Those creatures that still exist in an ex-human state, no longer reflecting their maker in any meaningful sense, can no longer excite in themselves or others the natural sympathy some feel even for the hardened criminal. Boom. All right? He says then, but I cannot end this chapter on that note. <laughs> for very good reason that the New Testament again and again refuses to end it on it either. Um... 
Likewise, the majestic but mysterious ending of the revelation of John, this is where I was going with Karen's comment, leaves us with fascinating and perhaps frustrating hints of future purposes, future work of which the eventual new creation is just the beginning. The description of the New Jerusalem in chapters 21 and 22 is quite clear that some categories of people are outside. The dogs, the fornicators, those who speak and make lies. But then, just as we have in our minds a picture of two nice, tidy categories, the insiders and the outsiders, we find that the river of life flows out of that city. That growing on either bank is the tree of life. Not a single tree, but a great many, and that the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Got the timing on this? There is a great mystery here, and all our speaking about God's eventual future must make room for it. There is not at all, there is not at all to cast doubt on the reality of final judgment for those who have resolutely worshipped and served the idols that dehumanize us and deface God's world. It is to say, that God is always the God of surprises. The New Testament, true to its Old Testament roots, regularly insists that the major central framing question is that of God's purpose of rescue and recreation for the whole world, the entire cosmos. So our question ought to be, how will God's new creation come? And then, how will we humans contribute to that renewal of creation and to the fresh projects that the Creator God will launch in this new world? Peter's question. The choice before humans would then be framed differently. Are you going to worship the Creator God and discover thereby what it means to become fully and gloriously human, reflecting His powerful, healing, transformative love into the world? Or are you going to worship the world as it is, boasting, boosting your corruptible humanness by gaining power or pleasure from forces within the world, but merely contributing thereby to your own dehumanization and further corruption of the world itself? What are we going to do? Yes. <clears throat> I'm not sure if I'm if I'm right, but or if I have a hint of what I'm thinking. But in essence, is this saying that if you're on the shore of the river of life in hell, then you still have a chance. I think what he's saying is yes, we've got a basic outline. Uh, his, his quote earlier was, what we have is a signpost pointing into the mist. Okay? And so here are the things we've been presented with, that we make decisions. Decisions that humanize us and worship God, and decisions that dehumanize us and others that don't. And that there's no room for them in the new creation, in the new city, the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. But the image that is given to us has to make us step back and do a final, I'm not sure exactly what God has in mind. And it's out of our control, which maybe is why it's worded that way. Because I think if it was very clear, then I could have some of you sit on this side because you didn't do it right. <laughs> well, Cindy's sitting over here. <laughs> and sit you over here. And I, and I know that we like to think we don't do that. But we do. We categorize people. We make insiders and outsiders. And yes, there are insiders and outsiders in God's kingdom. And we serve this gracious God whose intent is to restore everything and everybody. That's his intent, but it may not happen that way because everybody has free choice. Correct. You know. It may not. 
it may not. And we can't risk the possibility. Heaven is not the default position. Heaven is the default position. I'll disagree there. Heaven is the default position because that's God's intention. So that's the default position. This is what he, God intends. This is why he sent Jesus Christ. This is why he was bodily raised and given us the power through the Holy Spirit to live, to make human decisions, to live for him. Some will deny that. And yet we're still left with that image you brought up. Here's this city, and in the midst of that city is the river of life. But so, it say it flows out of the city. It, it says in chapter 22, the river of the wa- then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the, the river is the tree of life and, and all of that. But it's, then it's followed in the next verse by nothing accursed will be found there anymore, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his face and his name will be written on their foreheads. Then he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true, and it goes on and on, and it talks about not changing that word. Um, so I, I'm not sure it's as open-ended as... Um, I, I I'm, I'm, not working, I'm, that. I'm not working at making it open-ended. Okay. However, I'm not God. No, I agree. <laughs> And, and I'm not a universalist. Okay, that's good. Oh, I passed the test? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I just, I, it helped. It helped. Because, <laughs> I, I think, you know, again, because I believe that he's right about what happens here is important mm-hmm. and how we enact, live out the kingdom of God here, that there are certain things it doesn't help us to hold on to because we make other people's journeys more difficult. Like the title of, of that book, How Then Shall We Live? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're not God. How Then Should We Live? So title of a book. How does God want us to minister to the outsiders, the poor outsiders? Well, what about the thief on the cross? Mm-hmm. Next to Jesus. Mm-hmm. He yep. went to paradise. He went to paradise. It's not for us to decide or judge. He turned and he asked, though, and the one on the other side didn't. Right. But the Almighty decided. I'm sorry? Maybe he did, he, maybe he did decide. Yeah. Well, just as God isn't limited by time or space, his wisdom is unlimited as well, and we don't, we might think we understand his wisdom, but we don't. We don't understand his mercy and his grace to any extent, except in all that's really great. Right. I, I, how did he give me a moment, I think? I am well aware that I have now wandered into territory that no one can claim to have mapped. Christians believe, Christians believe, Jesus, Christians believe, has been to hell and back. But to say that is to stand gaping into the darkness, not to write a travel brochure for future visitors. (laughs) The last thing I want is for anyone to suppose that I, or anyone else, know very much about all of this. Nor do I want anyone to suppose I enjoy speculating on this manner but I find myself driven by the New Testament and sober realities of this world to this kind of resolution to one of the darkest theological mysteries. I should be glad to be proved wrong, but not at the cost of the foundational claims that this world world is the good creation of the one true God and that he will at the end bring about judgment at which the whole creation will rejoice. So, it's true, and lots of things are true. And how do we live with those things in a way that builds each other in the kingdom? And that's work. You know, those of you who have parented, 
know that you know some things before your children do. And you know that sometimes you got to keep your mouth shut, even though you're right. Why? You know, because you want them to get it. You know? And we've got a lot of wonderful work to do. And we've been blessed and honored to be chosen by God to be God's servants here in this earth. And I think one of the main messages that the resurrection gives us is that we are to cherish this and to cherish each other. And I'm grateful to be here to cherish it with you. Something different happens to us when we're together. You know, I hate to say it, but 55 minutes a week or an hour and 12 minutes a week, depending upon which service you attend. <laughs> and what side you sit on. <laughs> it isn't enough, is it? It isn't. Because it's not enough time to remind us that you are not picked solo to do this work. I'm not picked solo to do this work. We are picked together to do this work. Which is why I think the church is Christ's intent. And why Paul uses the imagery of us being the body of Christ. Doing the things Christ did while here in body. Oh, that was just a stretch. Okay. Before we go eat, Jim's going to make us a little bit later for supper. Yes, Jim? <laughs> but it's worth it. Okay. Yes, it is. is it? I'm still full from lunch. Yeah. I'm thinking of Monday night, the vestry is going to talk about the Hope Project <laughs> and what an incredible opportunity that is for the body to be letting this flow through out mm -hmm. into the world we're mm -hmm. in. Yes. Yes. And, and the people of God look for these opportunities because there are plenty. And there need to be plenty because we're not all the same. And some people can hear the good news when it's given in one phrase. And some people can hear it better when it's given in another phrase. And some people can hear it better when it's not spoken aloud at all, but acted out. Some people experience it when we sit back in our room miles away and pray for them. <coughs> All the work of God. The Lord be with you. <coughs> Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you uh, for the resurrection of your Son, our Savior. And we pray that you would help us to believe that that's true. And live in that reality and believe in that reality and maybe do it just a little bit more each day as we head upstairs to eat again we pray you bless our food bless our fellowship and we will continue to give you thanks we pray in jesus name amen, amen.